What's up everyone, my name is Eric and we at Constant Diversion are back to give you our picks for the games of the year. This series will continue weekly leading up to the end of the year, so without further ado, let's kick it off by introducing our first game on the countdown, Bloodborne. Before explaining what works so incredibly well about Bloodborne, it's important to first understand the roots of where this series comes from. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few years, you've either played, come across, or heard about From Software's Souls series. These games include Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 2. The games were extremely innovative for their level design, meta storytelling, deep RPG elements, and extreme difficulty. While the latter of these things was perhaps overstated with its prepare to die marketing, there is no denying the game's difficulty simply made it too intense for the mainstream market. However, slowly but surely, the sales for each game began to rise, mainly due to word of mouth from an extremely devoted fan base, but also the passion displayed by a seriously innovative YouTube community that involved many different content creators weaving bard-like tales to help piece together the Soul series' intentionally convoluted storytelling. If you don't believe me, look it up. While it's minimalist, once you put the pieces of these games' puzzles together, even the most hardened among us will be touched by their poignant narratives. Pursue the echoes of blood, and I will channel them into your strength. You will hunt beasts, and I will be here for you to embolden your sickly spirit. Following the success of Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1, series creator Hedetake Miyazaki began working on a new IP that would ditch the sword and board slog of Dark Souls for something a little more flashy. Indeed, the biggest difference between Bloodborne and the Souls games that came prior isn't the setting so much as the gameplay. The game is fast. The best defense isn't putting up your shield, it's getting the hell out of the way as fast as you possibly can, and then returning a quick thrust or firing a well-timed shot to pull off a critical attack. Yes, I said shot. There are guns in a Souls game. But in making these characters move so quickly, Miyazaki set aside the high fantasies the series was rooted in by placing the word action in Action RPG. Gone are the days of staring at the inventory screen and deciding which piece of gear can I put on my hands in order to carry the sword I want. Now it's more about does this hat go with this coat? Uh, suffice it to say, this left a few people divided on whether this was progress, regression, or simply something new. The answer, of course, is in the eye of the beholder. That's not to say this game doesn't have its fair share of customization, but nothing ever quite reaches the height of its predecessors. It's more uniformed, more flashy, but with that means less role-playing, and while the variety is limited, I will say there is something incredible about taking a stroll through Yarnum dressed to the nines, completely unruffled. So what makes this one of the best games of the year? Well, everything I just said, for one. The game is new in practice, but the innovation already existed. It simply took a step sideways, building on the legacy that came before it. Bloodborne is brutal, yeah, but Bloodborne is also not afraid to be beautiful. No game, and I mean this, no video game has ever made me appreciate the aesthetics of a world like Bloodborne has. The game's true innovation is just how effortlessly it lures you in with its melancholic Dickensian backdrop. Unlike the games that came before, the trepidation in previous Souls was directly linked to your fear of losing progress. Example being, when you enter a dark cave, you're afraid something in the dark cave will kill you, thus you don't want to enter the cave. But progress must be made, so what choice are you left with? Bloodborne's Yarnum, which is the main metropolis the game centers around, burns with possibilities that stress exploration rather than fear. It's easy to make something feel dangerous. It's difficult to make something feel alive. Yarnum has a pulse, and while it's essentially the same formula, it's also less formulaic. On the story side of things, Bloodborne continues the minimalistic approach like its predecessors and pulls an extremely unexpected late game twist. Whether the twist will have any true impact on you has more to do with whether you even understood anything that came before. That's always been the nature with these games. There are memorable characters and small segments of dialogue, but most of the story is actually revealed through various item descriptions that you read along the way. Well, that and a few lore notes that are scattered about. 
gothic horror transforms to Lovecraftian cosmic horror as the game progresses, and without spoiling, suffice it to say, it hits all the essential beats. It never reaches the heights of, say, Dark Souls 1, but what's here is good, and it's only made better by its incredible DLC, The Old Hunters. With Bloodborne, it's the world. It's so rich, so ripe, so real. Like the most authentic nightmare you've ever had, it works on you. When I was playing it for the first time, I had trouble getting it out of my head long after I'd shut it down for the night. Bloodborne isn't perfect, what is, but it's exciting and it's transcendent. In a year like recent years featuring an overcrowded market of immature spirits, Bloodborne is top shelf. In my first experience with its world, its characters, its lore, is something I'll remember from 2015 and through all the years that follow. Until next time, this is Eric signing off from Constant Diversion. May the good blood guide your way.